Hello all, my name is Alan Reeve and just thank you so much for coming. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the Mr. FPGA and I'm going to try to cover four basic points. Uh, first is we're going to talk about why it's a great solution for preserving vintage uh, computing hardware. Uh, second of all, um, we're going to talk about the general aspects of that. Uh, third, we're going to talk about my attempts to document this because Mr. FPGA's at FPGA is out there, you can get it, you can get these cores, but often they fall a little bit short in terms of how do you actually get using it. Um, a lot of people, you know, throw up game disks and so forth and that so you can boot into them, but I'm really interested in kind of taking it to the next level. Um, as I quote in my actual manual that I put together, um, I want to create that aspect of, I just got this computer on Christmas Day, I'm opening up the box, what can I do with it? How can I get going with this, with this computer? And uh, finally, we'll, we'll close with the demonstration of the device itself. Um, so, um, who am I? Um, Alan Reeve, I, I got started in computing uh, with an Apple II in grade school. I'm sure everybody has their story of, of how they got started. Um, begged and pleaded with my parents to get an Atari 8-bit computer. I was just entranced with computers and such. Uh, learned how to program it. Started actually writing commercial software while I was in high school. Uh, with one of my claims to fame being as I wrote the Diamond GOS, which appeared on the front cover of Antic Magazine back in the late 80s. Uh, moved on to Atari ST and PC clones. Um, always interested in uh, retro gaming, but it really uh, clicked in the mid-90s when I discovered that you could actually get old ColecoVision games for five bucks uh, through the internet news groups. Uh, that was kind of the, the big system when I was in junior high. It was just a thrill to get it. Uh, I was talking with a, a gentleman in the exhibit hall and that about you know, how he later on went and picked up that system that he wanted from his youth. Uh, same here. Um, and also, getting started in the mid-90s, I was fortunate enough to start collecting the stuff while it was still very affordable. You go to a thrift store and that, and they'd have you know, racks of old video game systems, cartridges, and so forth. Um, so, I've also always been interested in emulation. Um, in the late 80s, uh, trying to emulate an Atari 8-bit on an Atari ST um, didn't really prove too successful. The Atari ST just didn't have enough horsepower for that. Um, but the thing that really put it over the top and said, okay, this, this is really something that's feasible, uh, was a program called Sparkade. I don't know if any of you have heard of that. It was released in the mid-90s, and I really think Dave Spicer, who was the author of that uh, program just doesn't get the credit he deserves in that for really kind of feeding into to the whole MAME system, which is just the huge arcade emulation project uh, nowadays, and has since extended into emulating the old computers and so forth. Um, I think it's really important to preserve these old machines. Um, I think they're a, a big part of our culture. Um, and I also think these older machines have a huge benefit in terms of when I was programming the old Atari 8-bits in the mid-80s, I could comprehend everything that was going on inside of that system. You know there's some interrupts going on, you know this is happening. Give me any PC nowadays and that there's so much stuff going on with all the different processes and threads that are happening. You know, it's, it's just hard to do. So uh, programming the old, old systems is it's just a good, good learning environment. Um, so onwards, how do we preserve these old machines? Uh, well, the, the easy, straightforward method is, is maintenance. Keep the ones that we have working. And that's great, but it has pros and cons. Obviously, the big pro is that's the gold standard. If you want to test something, does it work on an Atari 8-bit computer? Well, if it runs on an Atari 8-bit computer, then I'd say it pretty much passes that standard. And quite frankly, any bugs that come along with the hardware, they're part of it too. They're part of that package in that as far as that standard. But as things, as time progresses in that, the parts get harder to find. You really need, you know, I convinced myself several years ago in that, that if I'm going to collect these old systems, I better be able to uh, be pretty good with a soldering iron in that because you're eventually going to have to recap them. Um, they're basically ticking time bombs, so if you're not going to do it, you've got to be willing to have a, a friend or a business or something like that do it, and you've got to be able to find a business that's willing to do it. Um, and of course, space, you know, if you're, I don't know, kind of addicted to the hobby like I am, you really need a lot of space in that to store all these systems, and of course, you can't just have one, you gotta have a backup in that just in case that first one goes bad. Um, so that's one pretty straightforward way, and then the second way that I think we're seeing is recreation in that. Having, having a system that is hardware, a hardware facsimile of the original hardware in that, but that comes with a lot of the same problems. You know, I mean, it's, it's close to the gold standard depending on how well it's done. 
um, but still very costly in that you're often getting new old stock type chips or in some cases, sometimes the chips are a recreation through FPGA, which we're gonna talk about in a bit because that's what Mr. is all about. Um, and of course, you still have the, the space issue. Um, question mark, you can probably guess what that is. That's the next slide. Um, but on the other extreme is emulation. And I'm not trying to dump on emulation here. Emulation's really pretty neat. Um, but it's just not the same thing. When you're emulating a computer, it, it is not the computer in that. You're basically, uh, trying to, I don't know how to put it, because there's a lot of talks in that. Some people are like, you know, so purist in that, to the, the mister. Um, but it's, it's creating the same end result, but you're taking a different set of steps in order to get there. So if you're reproducing a 6502 CPU, you're basically writing a program that's doing a loop, that's basically grabbing instructions in that, updating the memory in order to emulate custom chips in that. And when some memory address gets hit, you're gonna take some sort of action. That's not the way the original hardware worked. Might look pretty good. It's possible to write a fantastic emulator, but I think Mr. FPGA, FPGA is a better mechanism for bringing back and preserving these old systems. So, Mr. FPGA, what does FPGA stand for? It stands for Field Programmable Gate Array. Um, and basically the idea here is a 6502 CPU is essentially a set of logic gates, ands, ors, nands, nots, and so forth. And a field programmable gate array basically lets you write out this in software using a HDL, a hardware definition language. Uh, so you can actually take a 6502 logic diagram, you can convert it to HDL code, and you can have a 6502 processor there, it's authentic. It, it is basically the same as the original thing. It might not be an actual chip in that, but you have preserved that microprocessor in code. Now, one of the challenges with this type of uh, mechanism is some of these systems that have chips that are not as well documented or not documented at all. You know, sometimes these chips are trade secrets to companies. Uh, that takes a lot of effort, a lot of experimentation. And of course, the end result may not be exact because you did not have the original logic diagram. Um, so that is a negative, but by the same token with software emulation, got the same type of thing going on. You're doing experiments in that. How does the machine act if I do this? How does the machine act if I do that? So, um, so bottom line, it's not as if a Mr. Core is going to necessarily be perfect. It's gonna be as close as the original designer was able to make it based on the information that they have. Um, another really great thing about MISTER is it's entirely open source. Well, almost. There are a few cores out there in that that are proprietary and that someone's written them and that and they're trying to sell them and so forth. Um, but a lot of the stuff is available up on GitHub, which means if you wanna become active in the community, if you know HTML, please, if you know HTML, get involved in this. But if you know HTML, I'm still, not HTML, HDL, um, you can modify these cores, you can add features to them, and you're gonna see that a lot of these cores have some pretty, pretty neat features. Um, and finally, I have a, a YouTube summary, and I will put these slides uh, with these links up on the Mr. Manual uh, place in GitHub that I have. So what can it do right now? Uh, right now, it'll do all these systems. Will it do them all perfectly? Not all of them in that, but some of them are, uh, most of them are, are pretty, pretty accurate. Um, Lots of computers on the left, lots of video game consoles on the right. And one thing I will say um, is my general work cycle on this tends to be more November through uh, March. So if you go download the, the manual I have right now, it'll be dated April 2nd, I think. Um, and that's simply just my, my schedule. I don't have a whole lot of time in the summer to, to dedicate. But I'm getting close. Uh, for instance, um, being as this is open source, it's constantly evolving, and I know the Coleco Atom is one system that's uh, been added that's not on here that I have not let, had time to, to document. Uh, so lots of stuff. You notice I have many arcade cores, so not only are they trying to reproduce old video game hardware, old computer hardware, which is my focus here, um, there's also a lot of old arcade games in that that they've successfully uh, reproduced. And this device is just, if you ask me, what three technological devices would I bring in that if I was gonna be stranded on a desert island with a nuclear power plant so I could actually use them? Um, number one would be a PC still, flexibility. Um, but this would be number two. This is that great of a device to me. 
What are the limitations? Just like anything, it has memory. It has a, a finite capacity and a finite speed and so forth. Um, but because this is an open source project, as new FPGA-based boards come out, this runs on Altera Cyclone 5, I think it is, as new boards come out, you'll be able to port that stuff relatively easily. A lot of the HDLs are pretty similar in nature. Um, and I will throw out, if anybody is interested in HDL, a really great starter course is something called NAND to Tetris. You can find, they basically walk you through in that kind of the very basics of a hardware definition language and building an entire computer from a single NAND gate. It is actually a really great course, so I'll just throw that in there. Uh, but despite these limitations, there's still lots of stuff, lots of work to be done in that uh, for pre-1995 type stuff, which is pretty much around the year that this maxes out at. Uh, I do watch some of the Mr. YouTube videos that are out there, and I watched one recently, and the kind of hesitate to say complaint, um, but it was pointed out how you know it really struggles with some of those advanced 3D type games on a PC using the PC core, and it's like, well, yeah, I mean, it's not there, and that, that's not what this is. You're not gonna write a core that emulates or simulates a PC from the year 2020. It, you know, it does cap out. Uh, so uh, so on, to, on to the Mr. Manual, and I'm just gonna show you uh, what that is. And again, this is available. Um, just do a search on Mr. Manual in Google and you'll find it, um, but effectively, I you know, wish it, how do we view in page mode again? That works. Hard to see there, but, so basically I've broken it out each, each of the different computers, and then my goal with each of the systems is to follow a basic pattern in that of, of one thing that's usually different from these old systems is just the keyboard layout. One thing that was pretty common back in the early 80s was, for instance, your double quote would be a shift two, uh, whereas now the at sign is up there. Uh, so I try to provide and show you what the original keyboard looked like. And a lot of the times they try to, try to map it appropriately. It's one thing I'd love to see, kind of a, a generic keyboard type system in that where you could actually get the original keyboards for this, but then we're back to the space problem. Um, try to talk about what the original system could do, try to talk about how to get it going, uh, what type of software you need, the operating system, um, let's Look at another system here that's probably a little bit closer to home. Um, so there's the Apple II. Um, and I've gone through and I've talked about even in the machine code editor and that, what you can do to get things going to boot a disk and so forth, which is PR number six. Uh, just the basic commands. One of the big struggles with doing this type of project is how far to go. I'm not trying to rewrite the original system documentation. I just want to give you enough to get going and then I am trying to include links to that documentation so you don't have to hunt for it. Um, so that if you do get interested in a particular system that you know where to go to take the next step. Um, so that's the goal of this manual. <clears throat> so there's the actual URL again. You don't have to write that down or anything in that. If you do search for Mr. Manual on the internet, you will find it. Um, again, that's kind of how I'm trying to break things out and that, how do I load programs from disk? And one of the things that I say in my uh, uh, intro to the manual is I want you to be able to type in a basic program that'll print out the numbers from one to 10 and that, just to at least get you started with that. And that really has changed very much with systems and that from those from the 80s. Typically, a lot of those systems would power up uh, into basic and that, you'd be able to type it right in. The later systems, basic drop the line numbers, and nowadays basic isn't really much of a thing. Um, one thing that is interesting in that, that as I've done my work on this, there is one computer, I believe it's the Jupiter Ace, it doesn't boot up into basic, it boots up into fourth. So I give you a basic fourth program in that to get started there. Um, so let me do a quick demo and show you what the system actually does. I have to swap the HDMI cable out. And power it on. So, 
This is the mister. Very tiny. It's a ton of different computers in that in one little tiny box. This is actually somewhat souped up. It has a, sorry, has a uh, board in it called the D10 Nano. And then typically you add on an IO board to it. And then you'll add on some extra RAM to it. There are all sorts of extras that you can buy. You can get real-time clocks. You can get controllers. A lot of people are worried about low latency to make it the most authentic simulator of some of these old game consoles. But you'll see sticking out the side here um, is a half a terabyte memory card. That has all the different cores as well as software for the systems on. Um, but I have several USB uh, slots around it. And that, too, is an add-on board. <clears throat> and when Mr. boots up the interface, the interface is pretty basic. You just basically get text, go up and down, and I'm going to show you a few of the cores. Uh, so let's start off really retro. Let's go with the, uh, the ZX81. Okay, so that's what happens when you turn on a ZX81. Not terribly intuitive. The letter K down at the bottom, which is indicating that it's expecting a keyword. So I'm going to type in my little basic program. Yeah. And then you'll see it sticks a little S in there. And why does it do that? I explain that in the manual, because the ZX81 has this funky keyboard with all these little extra commands um, on it. And the actual command for that one, I'll back up. Um, is a shift four. P is print, types that whole keyword out for me. And is next. And R is run. Look at that blazing speed. Also illustrate all sorts of different settings in here. It can be a Z80 if I want to, different RAM sizes, and a lot of the cores have basically facilities for adding on all sorts of different hardware to them. But again, that's going to be core specific. One of the classic ZX81 programs is 3D Monster Maze. And in order to load that, it's a J for load obviously. And then I said I got to do shift P, shift P for quotes. And there you go. Not going to sit here and play this for hours or anything like that, but loads up 3D Monster Maze and I have played it. And it's not bad for a game from 1980. <clears throat> Let's move on and go to one of my favorite systems, the Atari 8 bits. So to change, I just go back to the core menu. Choose the Atari 800 core. Familiar sound. I will insert a disk, disk image. And then if you're familiar with the Atari 8 bits, they had a star to select an option button down the side. And those are through F6 through F8. So I have to hold F8. That's the sound of a disk loading on the Atari. And I think I 
made a mistake here and that I didn't want to disable basic. So I need the BIOS that has basic. That's my problem there. F10 to power it off and back on. That's better. So I can go to DOS. I've actually already typed in my program for this. So the Atari 8 bits had a very menu centric DOS. I can do a directory and see what's on there. B runs the cartridge, which is basic. And you can see it's quite a bit faster than the ZX81, thank God. And again, I'm just going to load a simple game, one of the better ones on the system, in my opinion, Archon. And you can see this is a pretty authentic recreation of the Atari 8-bit systems with all the extra players the graphics and all that type of stuff. I got two more to show you. Let's do the Commodore Amiga next. And in case you're curious why the name Mister, Mister actually comes from Mist, and the MI stands for Minimig, which was an FPGA solution that was just the Amiga, and ST comes from the Atari ST. And then Mr. is effectively the success for that. The Mist, I believe, had a proprietary type board, whereas the Mr. is a generic off-the-shelf part. There is the Amiga telling me to stick my discs in. Should boot now. It'll take a second. You'll see it will reference that I could actually have a real-time clock in there, but I do not have that component in this one. Okay, and there's our Amiga workbench. So basics on the extras disk. And again, this is, this is one of the cores. They've been working on this HDL for ages and that because of the original. And that's one thing you'll see with a lot of these FPGA cores. They actually get ported from other systems. So I can load up Amiga basic. And the Amiga moved into the, the world of no line numbers for your basic. And if I want to run that, go up to the menu here, run start, voila. And let's take advantage of something that the Amiga can do that those other systems don't do. And that's they build speech synthesis into their basic.
It takes a second or so to initialize. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And just imagine the electricity if you were in a room in 1986 and your computer did that. And I'm going to show the Acorn Archimedes core. That's a computer that in the States we aren't quite as familiar with, but it's a really neat system. So it sported a full GUI. I, I believe it was 68K based. No, I'm sorry, the risk based. <laughs> Yeah, I believe it was certainly early. Okay, one of the challenges of this is F12 is the key that takes you to uh, the Mr. Menu system, but like a PC, the Acorn Archimedes has an F12 key, so suddenly I have to use one F12 to get there. So the drive icons are down at the bottom on this computer, and I'm just going to show you one of the more popular demo type programs that they use in their advertising. There's something a little off with this particular disk image, but that doesn't seem to prevent it from ultimately working. And that's this kind of Lunar Lander 3D game. But again, if you were looking at this in the late 80s, this would have knocked your socks off. But essentially there's a little ship in that, and I hold down the mouse button, and I can fly it around this kind of fractally type terrain using the mouse. And I'm not terribly good at it. So I can hit escape. Get back to here. And another example. I showed you me accidentally hitting the F12 key and getting this little asterisk down at the bottom of the screen. That's the command line on the Acorn Archimedes. And that's all covered in the, the manual. And I can run basic. That would be a problem. There we go. Um, and one of the things that's really actually cool about this computer's basic is they actually integrated assembly language access into the basic language itself. And I don't mean just poking stuff into memory locations. I mean, you could actually embed assembly language in it. You can see it is case sensitive. Thank you. Okay, so how do you get a mister? Uh, well, typically it starts with buying one of these DE10 nano boards. They run for about 220-ish now, although unfortunately the whole chip shortage issue in that is making them hard to get at present. Um, typically you'll want an IO board, you'll want some memory. Maybe, maybe not, you can probably get by without a USB hub or you can probably plug an external one in that's powered. You don't need the case, but it certainly makes it nicer and makes me feel a little bit better than I'm not touching my ICs directly with my hands. Um, so a pretty complete system here, and that is about four to $500, which may sound like a, a hefty price tag, but when you consider all that you get out of this thing, uh, that seems like a bargain to me. Um, you can also buy pre-assembled ones. Um, I purchased my stuff from a site called ultimatemister.com, which is a guy named uh, Ricardo, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name, I'm probably, probably butchering it, Sariva. Um, 
You can also find him in the Facebook group, uh, but he's been actually great to deal with, but there's plenty of other companies out there uh, that do this, um, and lots of information out there. This isn't, isn't a huge secret. Uh, so in conclusion, um, I think this is a phenomenal device in that simply because the idea of preserving the old hardware by actually preserving the logic gates and the stuff that went into creating the hardware um, is just so much better than, than software code in that that tries to recreate it best. Um, I think that's really cool. Um, one of the challenges is there are a lot more coders out there than that that know C++ and such and that versus HDL, uh, but that's why I bring up things like NAND to Tetris um, to get people started in that. Um, as far as using um, FPGA-type devices for computer preservation, this probably is the device in that in 2022. Uh, there are others out there. There's one called Replay FPGA in that that, that has never really been released in large quantities. Um, this seems to be it today. Um, and one of the cores that has been released in the past couple of months in that that just really shows the capabilities of the system um, is a PlayStation core that's pretty much 100%. It, it's just, so it's emulating or simulating your 3D graphics chips and everything. Uh, just a, a brilliant job by the, by the guy that did that. Um, not trying to pretend that this is, this is the end all and be all. There will be other devices down the line. Um, this does have its limits. Um, and likewise, the cores themselves have their limits. If I write a really, really good emulator and I write a really, really bad core, you can probably guess which one's gonna be better, the really, really good emulator. Uh, so it is going to come down to the, to the code that's written. Um, and the last thing, one of my core reasons for being here is just if you have the ability to help out with this project and that of documenting these systems, I could certainly use it. Um, if you have information and so forth, I was talking to a, a guy in the vendor hall about the Altair 8800 because I got really no idea where to go with that and he was really pretty kind to, to uh, provide information. Um, if you have that type of specific knowledge for any of these systems and that, you think that you can improve a spot in the manual on that, uh, take a look, look and let me know. Um, are there any, any questions about this? Wow, two present. Question. Oh, first, thanks for documenting and going over all this stuff. Um, it seems like every time I kind of look at Mr. I get kind of overwhelmed with like all the options and like all the extras is, you know, I don't know, is there a good real guide on like say, I want to play these systems so that's what I'm going to, this is what I need or, you know, because it seems like you could just keep adding and adding and adding, then it'd just be unreasonably priced, right? Uh, um, so you're talking about getting started. I'm having a little bit hard time hearing. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I mean, just what? getting started like, there's so many different options, it seems like, and kind of get into analysis paralysis, like what, what systems do I want to run, what extras do I need, or, you know, if, like that kit you showed, that does everything, or is there, I don't know. Um, so so that's, that's a pretty general question in that, as far as how, how to get started and such. Uh, there are lots of YouTube videos that help you get started, um, but ultimately that's, you probably need to pick a system in that. This is the system I'm going to start with. Um, usually, you know, in my case, that was probably the Atari 8-bits because I knew quite a bit about that already. Uh, the goal of this particular project and that is to document the systems that I didn't know about because I would come back to the Commodore 64 core and I would have no idea what I was doing and I would need a reminder. I wouldn't want to go have to start, start over. Um, there's also the aspect of options in terms of buying the system. Um, you probably want the IO board, you probably want the RAM, and you, probably, and you need the, the Terrastic Nano. That's the, that's the start there. And that if you, um, I believe it's possible to run some of the cores on just the Terrastic by itself, but to really get the full benefit of the system, you, you really do want all three of those. Um, as far as the actual instructions and getting started, I would probably just YouTube the particular system that you are looking at and Mr. and that, and you probably would find something in that as far as getting started. Um, the other aspect as far as getting started with a particular core is, is features in that. And, and the one that comes to mind when you say that is the Amiga. Uh, the Amiga has so many different system setup options in that with fast RAM and slow RAM and this RAM and, and such. Um, that's something that I do try to document in this. I talk about an Amiga 500 is going to be these settings, an Amiga 1200 is going to be these settings, um, and so forth. Does that help at all or answer? So. 
Okay. Well, in that case, thank you for coming. If you, if you want to take a closer look at the device, you're welcome to, to come on up. Um, but thanks. Question back there. So, uh, you know, like we've got various emulators, of course, over time, and, and some things work better than others. And what's, how do you, like, are all of these FPGA, I don't know, I'm, emulations probably, all of these FPGA recreations perfect? Are some of them like 50% correct? And then what's, you know, what's the path when you find one that doesn't work right? Okay, so no, they're definitely not all perfect. Uh, one that I have on here is a, is a PC-88. That's probably lacking a little bit. Um, by the same token, these FPGA simulations and that, and I use the word simulation when I'm talking about that versus emulation, but there's a whole debate. So that's, that's how I try to uh, use the terminology. Um, but they're clearly not all perfect. They're all written by people. Uh, you're more likely to have success with something where the original logic diagram, so the 6502, for instance, that's a pretty standard FPGA HDL component now in that, so, you're, so that part's going to be fine. When you start dealing with custom chips, that's when you start running into problems, especially the undocumented custom chips. Uh, there's a game company that's known for, you know, not doing that very well uh, that ends in DO. Um, they have lots of proprietary type stuff and they don't make it very public. So in order to recreate their stuff, it's a lot of experimentation. And that's kind of out of my wheelhouse. My understanding is people will sit down with these chips and play around with their oscilloscope and pulse this and see what comes out of that side uh, type thing. But again, I, I, I haven't done that, so I don't have any experience with it. Um, but to try to, in a nutshell, no, they're not perfect. Um, I do try to indicate some of that. I believe one of the cores that I saw, um, um, I forget, oh, I believe it's the Auric 1. Um, I had some weirdness when I was using that core, and I've tried to ask around a little bit about it and haven't gotten any real resolution. I did want to try to compare it with an emulator that's supposed to be pretty good and such. I have not done that yet, and it's all time. Um, but there isn't really a chart that I know that says this is 100%. Um, I think the Amiga is pretty close, but I've seen people report uh, that, oh, this demo doesn't quite run perfect. Um, by the same token, these cores are constantly being improved and upgraded. If people do find problems in that, they do try to fix them. Um, but it's also open source, so you know there's nobody that's on the clock in that that's being forced to do it by somebody. Thank you. How, how does the FPGA lock the? How does it lock the speed correctly to whatever system it's trying to simulate? Uh, my understanding, uh, not being somebody that's written cores, is there is a clock, uh, obviously in the system itself and then you're able to code and adjust that clock and that, whether it's using a division for the clock or whatever and that, that part I'm not sure. But they are able to get the clock accurate. Do, do any of them bounce the clock up to a higher speed or anything to improve performance? Yes, they do. In fact, one of, the, one of the cores on here is the ZX Spectrum Next, which is the souped up Spectrum, and they have all the ability to toggle in that and make it run two, three, whatever times as fast as the original Spectrum. Yes but that's gonna be core dependent, so they don't all do that. Hi, um, so I have a penchant for collecting industrial and scientific equipment, and so for instance, I have a scanning electron microscope that I'm restoring. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having a really hard time understanding. So I have a penchant for collecting uh, industrial and scientific equipment, and uh, for instance, like a scanning electron microscope. How hard would it be to get something like ISA bus connected up to the AO486 core? I have no idea. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I'll be honest, I have no idea. Do you find that there's a community that are interested in generally in attaching hardware beyond just like uh, input devices? I have to... not seen a whole lot in terms of that. I believe and I may be wrong here, I believe somebody's done it so you can actually hook the tippy up to the TI-99 4A core, uh, which is an add-on device that simulates the giant TI-99 4A box. Um, my thing here, it's basically all USB. 
Uh, so you'd have to, if you were going to bridge something else in that, like an isobus, you'd, you'd somehow have to do it through that. Gotcha. But hardware is not my specialty, so. Cool. Thank you. Okay, again, thank you so much for coming. Got a mister.